Hi, this is Topology Review, Part B, Simplicial Homology. In the first part of the review, Part A, we discussed simplicial complexes and we were focusing on their features, the components, tunnels, and voids. Here are three examples to remind us of what's going on. On the left, we see simplicial complex in the plane has one connected component, one tunnel. The tunnel goes through the three edges that we see missing a face, so here. Okay. In the second example, we see three connected components. There's a hollow tetrahedron, so the boundary of a three simplex, the boundary of a two simplex, the triangle, and then a two simplex. That gives us three components. There's one tunnel. Again, the tunnel goes through the boundary of the two simplex. And there's one void that's inside the hollow tetrahedron. Okay. In the last example, we have two connected components. We have a large hollow tetrahedron in blue. And inside that, we have a single solid tetrahedron, so a three simplex. The two are not connected. So that gives us two connected components, no tunnels, and one void, the void coming from the hollow tetrahedron. Now, in these cases, it was relatively simple to figure out what's going on. We could see that all the pieces, there weren't very many simplices. But that's not always the case. So here's another example that's more involved. So you see here on the left, it's an image from the protein data bank of a chaperone protein called 1WNR. So it's showing you the structure. It's called the secondary structure. So we see what are known as alpha helixes in blue and beta sheets in red. Okay, the primary structure would tell us the position of the atoms in the protein molecules. Okay, now on the right, what we see from a different angle, somewhat different angle, is a collection of points. Those points are the locations of the alpha carbons in the protein. So for each amino acid in the protein, there's a first carbon in the chain, that's called the alpha carbon. So here we have the alpha carbons. There are far too many for us to plot. So this uses the method of RIPS to, to choose a distance and to construct a simplicial complex on that point set. So here it is. And we see several tunnels through the point set. We might not be seeing them all, nor are we sure about how many voids there are. So here's a case where it's a complicated simplicial complex. You can't just tell by looking what's going on. In this case, we would need some sort of computational method, which is where we're heading. So we're looking at homology. This is a method based on linear algebra. It allows us to calculate the number of distinct components, tunnels, and voids in a simplicial complex. So intuitively, we want to create vector spaces mod 2 for the vertices, for the edges, and so on. Certain subsets of these vector spaces, called cycles, capture connected components, for, that's dimension zero, tunnels in dimension one, and voids from dimension two. Equivalence classes of cycles uniquely label the components, tunnels, and voids. So the vector space algebra organizes the equivalence classes into vector spaces over Z2, so that's Z mod 2Z. We're doing it, thinking of it as vector spaces, but we could also think of it as abelian groups. Okay, so let's move on. Where we start is what are called chain groups. We have a simplicial complex X. We see it has vertices, edges, faces, possibly higher dimensional simplices. We're going to create a vector space for each of those dimensions. So here in dimension zero, we're going to look at sums of vertices. So here's C0 of X. The, the elements of it are sums A1, X1, up to AK, XK, so on. And the coefficients AI are either zero or one. So we should think of that as if it's a one, then the point is in the sum, the vertex is in the sum. If it's a zero, it's not. In this example on the right, we see we have eight vertices. So in this case, our sum would be have eight terms in it. And we can think of this as an element of Z2 to the eighth. So eight copies of Z2. If we go to dimension one, so here's C1x on the left, we're thinking of, of sums of edges. Here's an example, we have A12, E12, plus A13, E13, and so on. If a coefficient AIJ is zero, then you would say the edge is not present. If it's one, it's present in the sum. Now again, in the example on the right, we see we have 12 edges. So in this case, our sum would be an element of 12 copies of Z2. Okay. 
And lastly, we can do it for dimension two in this example. This would be sums of faces. So here's C2. The sums would be of faces F, I, J, K. And here you see there's another index, one, two, and so on, in case there were many faces. Now, in the example we have here, though, it's relatively simple. We see on the left in the example, we have a pink triangle. That's a two, two simplex. And on the right, we have a blue one. So we have two copies of Z2. So now let's go up and see what we have in the diagram. There's some examples here. So first we see a, a chain C0. So if we see lowercase c0, that means it's an element of capital C0. In this case, we have x1 plus x2 plus x5, and we see the red dots uh, pointing out that chain. We have c1. Little c1 is a sum of edges, e4, 5, plus e5, 7, plus e7, 6, plus e4, 6. And that's in yellow in the diagram. Finally, we have a single face. F678, that's a chain lowercase c2, and that's the two simplex on the right. Now, if we think of this algebraically, the xi are acting as a basis for c0, the eij act as a basis for c1, the fijk act as a basis for c2. So we're using the symbols xi both as a point in the complex and as a basis vector in c0, and so on. Okay, let's go on to the next page. So we don't have just the vector spaces. We also have boundary maps. This is what makes equivalence possible. So here I've written it down for x of dimension 2. So we see we have the, the chain groups, c2, c1, c0, and the boundary goes between them. And you notice we've also added a 0 on the left and a 0 on the right. That's so at each of c2, c1, and c0, we can treat them in the same way. We need to have the incoming boundary 3 and the outgoing boundary 0 on the right. So each boundary i is a linear transformation of z2 vector spaces, or we could say it's a homomorphism of abelian groups. It's equivalent in this context. So we can define a linear transformation by defining it on basis vectors, or we could say group generators. In this case, I've written it out. Uh, boundary 2 of fijk. That's the sum of the edges, Eij plus Ejk plus Eik. Now that's defined for a single face. If we want to define it on a pair or more, a sum of more faces, we do it by linearity. So boundary two of this sum is equal to the sum of boundary two on the first face and boundary two on the second. And here we see it for edges two. We similarly, we see a sum boundary one of two edges equals boundary one of the first edge plus boundary one of the second edge. Now, as to those two new boundaries we put in, boundary 3, on the left we see 0, so we just have boundary 3 of 0 equals 0. And on the right we have boundary 0 of xi equals 0. Okay, let's go on. Now we have cycles and boundaries. Since boundary i is linear, kernel and image are subspaces. And these carry information about the topolo topological features. So it's not just the chains we want, it's the particular chains that lie in the kernel and the image. So here we have a definition of the kernel. So the kernel of boundary i is the set of all i chains, so that's lowercase ci, so that the boundary is zero. Similarly, we have the image. So we have the image of boundary i plus one, that's all ci in capital ci, so that there exists a little ci plus one, the boundary of little ci plus 1 equals ci. Notice the way we've written it with the different boundaries. Boundary i for kernel and boundary i plus 1 for image. That's so we're looking at subspaces that are in capital ci, as you can see it here. So we have a name for these. <coughs> capital zi is used for the kernel of boundary i. The elements are called cycles. Uh, capital BI is the image of boundary I plus 1 contained in CI. Those elements are called boundaries. So for any I plus 1 simplex sigma, we can look at the composition. Sigma I plus 1 first, that gives us a, a sum of I faces and then boundary I. This equals 0. Again, from what we said above, linear transformations are defined uh, by their behavior on basis vectors. We just have to check it for basis vector. So here, Here's a face, fjkl, 
We first take boundary two of it. That gives us a sum of edges. We take boundary one of the sum of edges and we see on the right, sum of vertices. And of course, we see each vertex appearing twice. Since we're working mod two, it cancels, they cancel and we get zero. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So here's a different picture of that fact. And it's an important fact that the composition of boundary I plus one followed by boundary I is zero. And this means the zero transformation, zero on every chain. This gives us a key property. It says that the image of boundary I plus one, that's the output of boundary I plus one, when we feed it into boundary I, we get zero, so it's in the kernel of boundary I. Or we could say that capital BI is contained in ZI. So here's a schematic diagram which represents this. So you see CI in the middle. So here's CI, the large, cir large circle. Inside that we have a smaller circle representing the kernel, capital ZI, and we see the red goes to zero on the right. So all of those elements go to zero. And inside capital ZI, we see little BI, uh, capital BI, sorry, that's smaller. That's the image of CI plus one. So we see the blue boundaries. So that's the image of boundary I plus one contained inside of the kernel boundary I, which is ZI. And you can see this picture extends to the right and to the left. And had we had more of these chain groups, this picture replicates itself as we go, All right? Now, keeping that in mind, we have subspaces. So let's go on and see what we get next. Okay, so our intuition is going to be that cycles capture topological features. So here's an example that's easy to see in dimension one. So in this case, the chains are capturing, so the chains which are one dimensional are capturing tunnels. Here we see the simplicial complex X down below. If we look at C1 in capital Z1, that means boundary C1 equals zero. So that says every vertex occurs an even number of times in boundary one C1, so all the terms cancel. Well, that means each vertex in C1 is an endpoint of an even number of edges. That's how we get cancellation, all right? So let's see what this gives us. Here's an example, here's the complex. In yellow, we see a cycle. So we see a cycle in yellow on the left, it's a quadrilateral, but it's the boundary of two, two simplices. So that's a cycle, it's also a boundary. In red, we see a cycle that's not a boundary. So it's not the boundary of any number of triangles. Okay? But we can also have in green something that's not a cycle. So here's a collection of edges. If we take the boundary, it would have two points in it. It would have the point down at the bottom, and it would have this vertex here where three edges come in. Three mod two is one, so we would see those two points showing up in the boundary. So that means it's not a cycle because the boundary is not zero. So here we have an illustration of the three things that can happen. And in our picture on the previous page, we would see red would be in a cycle, <clears throat> yellow would be a boundary, it's contained in the cycles, and green is not a cycle. Okay, let's move on. So now to homology. So we have boundaries or cycles, so that's bi contained in zi, and it's also contained in the chains, we can define the quotient of zi by bi. This is a vector space quotient, or if we were thinking about groups, it would be a quotient group. And we hi is defined to be this quotient. So we say homology is cycles mod boundaries. So an element of hi is called a homology. So what are the elements? The elements are equivalence classes of cycles and the next and last part of the review, we go over the calculation of boundary I and HI for some examples. This is the end of part B. Thank you.